German U-boat development in the Weimar Republic. Welcome to Interesting History. The First World War demonstrated to the world that submarine forces were an essential ingredient to any country's naval and overall war fighting capability. German U-boats wreaked havoc on Allied service fleets throughout the war. The victors of the First World War wanted to make sure that this couldn't happen again. So in the Treaty of Versailles they imposed big naval restrictions on the German state in the 1920s when the Treaty of Versailles went into effect. These restrictions of the German Navy were as follows. In the Section 2 Naval Clauses, Article 181, in which the victors of the First World War laid out what kind of ships the Germans could keep, these were 6 battleships of the Deutschland class, all lowering in type, 6 light cruisers, 12 destroyers, 12 torpedo boats, or an equal number of ships constructed to replace them as provided in Article 190. This together with Article 191, which stated The construction or acquisition of any submarine, even for commercial purposes, shall be forbidden in Germany. This meant that after the First World War, Germany wasn't allowed to have any submarine or actively try to develop them. Germany, however, would not forget the importance of the U-boats as an essential element to the military might. Through secret operations, Germany would try to retain and actually improve her U-boat technology despite the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles in the 1920s and 30s. The world powers at this time between the Great Wars acted if they had blinders on where Germany was concerned. The Treaty of Versailles had forbidden any buildup of German military forces. As a result of this, the United Kingdom, Japan, France, Italy, and the United States failed to pay any attention to Germany's technological advancements in the U-boat construction during those years. Despite the Weimar Republic's financial problems, which were caused by massive reparations they had to pay to the French and British, money was not a major obstacle. The Reichsmarine acquired 100 million Reichsmarks between 1919 and 1922 from the sale of ships, scrapped by the order of the Allies. With this budget, the Reichsmarine established two unbudgeted secret funds. A special fund under Captain Walter Lohmann and a black fund under Captain Gottfried Hansen. With the aid of these secret funds, Group Germania Werf, based in Kiel, AG Wesser, based in Bremen, and Fulkan Werft, based in Hamburg and Stetten, established a joint stock company in the Netherlands in 1922. The NV Ingenieurskantoor for Scheepbouw, or shortened as the LVS, which translates to Engineering Office for Shipbuilding. The company acted as a submarine design and consulting bureau consisting of at least 40 German submarine engineers. The LVS officially opened for business in October 1925 and in time built 8 U-boats with German machinery for the Kawasaki shipyard at Kobe, Japan, as well as submarines for Finland, Spain, Sweden and Turkey. Krupp and thus the German state legitimized the business venture by selling shares of the company which meant that before long, a perfectly respectable international business had become a breeding ground and training environment for Germany's ever-growing U-boat engineering and design capability. Slowly but steadily, the German Navy acquired a 28% interest in LVS as well as chairmanship of its executive board. Two dummy corporations, Mental Blianz and after 1929 Ingwit, which stands for Ingenieurs Bureau for Gewichtshaft und Technik acted as liaison between the German Navy and LVS. The first breakthrough for the LVS came in 1924 when it sold designs for four U-boats to Finland. The following year, a special subversion of 1 million Reichsmarks from Lohmann helped place orders for two Turkish U-boats at the Rotterdam yacht of the LVS, and in 1928, the Spanish government, through Commander Willem Canaris, ordered a 600-ton submarine from the Germans. In all cases, German engineers drew up plans at the LVS. Engines came from Germany, LVS, at the final shipyard at Rotterdam, assembled the ship's parts, while only final assembly occurred at the Ezequerita yard at Cardiz in Spain. 1925 marked a turning point in U-boat development. Buoyant by the financial windfall of the government's diversion of 190 million from the DOS plan, launched to AEG, Krupp, Siemens Schuckert and Thyssen for rearmament. The German Navy established a special bureau to deal with the anti-submarine warfare question. 
in reality a thinly disguised U-boat development office. In 1925, Admiral Hans Zenker commented on his bureau by naming its function. Advance our plans and allow us to gather experience in the further development of weapons otherwise forbidden to us. Perhaps most importantly, Senka appointed the recently retired Rear Admiral Arno Spindler as the U-boat specialist at the Naval Archive. Spindler used his position to guide German submarine development over the next decade. The Navy broadly defined his mission as follows. To gather wartime experiences of U-boat commanders, to coordinate submarine activity among German firms operating abroad, establish a theoretical U-boat training program, establish an espionage network to gather information on submarine innovation occurring elsewhere, run a propaganda bureau to attack the Treaty of Versailles submarine restrictions, and develop contingency plans for use of U-boats in future warfare. Spindler made slow but steady progress. The Naval Academy began a regular U-boat training program for midshipmen and the class of 1924 was the first to study the history of the U-boat campaign as part of the professional education. Multiple crews helped work on boats being built in Finland, Sweden and Spain, thus providing German submariners with sea experience. Not surprisingly, the first submarine training officer at Flensburg was Lieutenant Commander Weiner Furbinger who had gained sea experience in 1927-1928 during the trials of the U-boats being constructed in the Netherlands for Turkey. His successor, Lieutenant Commander Robert Broutingham, likewise had gained realistic training experience delivering boats to Finland, Spain and Turkey. Spindler also collected wartime accounts of Imperial submarine commanders with an eye towards preparing the Navy for future conflict. By 1922, former U-boat ace Lieutenant Commander and later Admiral Kurt von Millentein had rigorously reviewed the technical shortcomings of his wartime boats. He found them too slow, too lightly armed, incapable of diving more than 75 meters and lacking adequate refit and repair bases. Lieutenant Commander and later Admiral Willem Marshall complimented Mettelheim's study the same year. The future German fleet commander demanded that the U-boats be able to sustain dives to 100 meters, more rapid dives to periscope depth, and smaller turning radius. Unlike Melantine, Marshall also addressed issues of deployment and training. Any naval war, he argued, would immediately see the introduction of convoys from the start. Hence, German U-boats must train for night surface attacks. This approach would provide surprise, allow greater speed with the diesel motors, increase torpedo firing and permit easier escape. While some argued that the advance in detection devices had rendered service attacks obsolete, Marshall's recommendation became German doctrine in 1935, but with Captain Carl Donitz taking full credit. In 1927 and 1928, the naval staff had drafted contingency plans for the future U-boat force of 84 boats. 36 smaller 360-ton F-boats, 12 800-ton T mine layers and 36 650-ton G-boats. The planners at the time rejected larger boats up to 7,500 tons as slow, unwieldy, vulnerable to attack as gun platforms and useless in any war against commerce, as World War I had shown. Such speculative plans took a more realistic approach with Defense Minister General Kurz von Schleicher's Umbauprogram of July 1932. Under the plan, Germany would create a U-boat arm, a naval arm, and three U-boat divisions of 16 craft over the next five years, all in flagrant violation of the Treaty of Versailles. While Schleicher's proceeded cautiously, for example, initially only storing the requisite U-boat materials until the political situation allowed actual construction. The secret operations weren't forever. The political situation on which Defense Minister General Kurt von Schleicher was waiting were quickly changing in the Weimar Republic. Not long after the UMBO program of July 1932 changed the political environment drastically with the appointment of Hitler as Chancellor on 30 January 1933. So, in the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s, 
when Germany set to adhere to the Treaty of Versailles in respect to the restrictions on U-boats. In reality they did everything they could to improve their U-boats. Not only did they use the LVS in the Netherlands to improve their U-boat technology and designs, they also used the newly built ships for Sweden, Finland, Spain, Turkey and Japan as training vessels for their U-boat crews and teachers for the new U-boat generation of officers and commanders.